Well, as they're making their way out of the, the gym here, I'd like to welcome our online congregation at this point in the service as well. And um, we will uh, proceed with turning to the scriptures. Um, the book of Ephesians, please, chapter five, uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. I'm sure... All of us here, our hearts go out to the Ukrainians and in their plight have a Goliath-like enemy that's disinformed, deceived, planted rebels, planted evidence to justify military action and now has attacked this European country. Very little, even though it's, a good, it's the largest country in Europe, very little in comparison to Russia. And I would ask, Imagine if the Ukrainians had the weaponry to hold off the Russians. Imagine that they had the means to resist and have refused the Russians even one inch of their territory. And right now that's what we'll have to do is imagine. Um, the reality may be far different, but certainly a lot of us are rooting for the Ukrainians. Um, and hoping that this war can be over and can, things can be moved on. But in this scenario, this world picture, if you will, there is somewhat of an illustration. Uh, if Ukraine does actually come to possess the weaponry to overcome monster Russia, it would be a good illustration of the spiritual reality for Christians that by God's power, Believers can stop Satan and company from plundering and re-enslaving us. The devil and his forces are rampaging in our culture right now. And he's behind those who are push, so-called pushing the envelope, who are gaining influence and authority over people's minds and hearts and their thinking. He and his forces are trying to erase biblical values, biblical thinking, and um, punishing those who hold to those values and to those thinkings. But God has not left his children powerless. He has issued us divinely powerful weapons, weapons that are battle-tested, weapons that are proven, weapons that don't misfire or fail, and they work every time they're used. And our Lenten sermon series is going to look at those, that weaponry, if you will. We're looking at the armor of God, what the scripture calls the armor of God. And the purpose for our sermon series is to get buy-in, to have us hold what the scripture teaches, that they are divinely powerful weapons, that it is the power of God in them, and then buy in to actually put the armor on more and more. Because really, what is the armor of God? It's what the power that God has already given us in union with Christ, as well as the strength that he does give us when we employ the, those armor of God weapons. And his purpose is to help us to resist the evil one's attempt to deceive us, again, to enslave us, to crush us. That we would resist wickedness and in so doing, encourage others around us. And so I'd like to have you think with me uh, for our communion meditation that the Lord can help us overcome the devil's tricks. And so we're gonna look at Ephesians 5, starting at verse 15. This is the section about the filling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit, giving our hearts over to his power and influence is so important to our possessing the armor of God. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And what follows from there are examples of what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Part of that was the singing to one another, but also the Christian roles and relationships between husband and wife, parents and children, employers and employees, but also the Christian in his or her battle with evil. And uh, that brings us to chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of, of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." so that you may know, you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Again, our theme is that the Lord can help us overcome the devil's tricks. And we want to look at that in three ways. One is who is for us. Second, who is against us. And thirdly, who wins. First of all, who is for us. I'd have you consider with me what the power and strength that are already ours in our union with Jesus Christ. Because in and ourselves, in and of ourselves, we don't have any natural immunity, shall we say? We don't have any resistance against Satan, against spiritual evil, against the demons of Satan. In fact, we used to be Satan's slaves, we're told in chapter two. We followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. And we didn't know that until God saved us. We didn't know that we were in Satan's hands to do with as he will, of course, under God. The power to overcome Satan's tricks is something that had to be imported into us. It's not natural to us, but it is given to us in, in Christ or in union with being bound spiritually and in faith to Jesus Christ in union with the Lord. It's the strength that comes from his might, from what he has done and the effects of what he's done. For example, Christ's power, Christ's might, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are loved with an unquenchable love, an unbreakable love. That's power. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were destined or designed for holiness and blamelessness before him, which his power will accomplish in us. God adopted us to himself through Christ, adopted us to be his children and his heirs. We have that power of belonging. Now you might be thinking, how is this power, you know, where's the beef? Where's the muscle? Where's the force? We have to remember that we are not talking about flesh and blood power, but we're talking about spiritual power. We're talking about inner person 
power. To be loved by God and to know that we are loved by God. To know that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives and that life is not random. To know that we are not orphans, but we belong to God's family and that he has set aside a very rich and abundant um, inheritance for his family. These are things, these are necessary forms of power that help Christians change for the good as God defines it. To know that our sins are forgiven is power, especially when Satan beats us up with false guilt, which he loves to do. Spiritual sight, spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, Holy Spirit enlightenment, truth confirmation in our hearts, Christian hope, these are all forms of power. Power that sustains God's people. This is a strength of might that is already ours in Christ and in union with him. But there's more. You have Christ's infinite personal power that lives within the believer right now. I'm speaking of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Um, Paul talks about Jesus being accursed for our sins, dying in our place, that we might be sealed with the Holy Spirit. A seal in the sense of permanence, but also a seal in a sense of we are God's possession. So you have this power living in us right now. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, we're told. But the question is, do you believe that? And do I believe that? And more importantly, we might believe that right now while we're sitting in these nice comfy chairs and nothing really is chewing on us. But will we believe it when things are tense and we are in a hospital waiting room where we just got bad news about a family member, um, name it, will we still believe that we have the Holy Spirit living in us and that he gives us power, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world? And Paul talks about this in chapter 1. He describes the power that's in us as the same power that raised Christ from the dead and glorified and ascended him to heaven. In chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul talks about this. He said, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. One, one author put it this way, and I thought it was very powerful. He said, in our fight against the devil, and of course the world and the flesh, he said, we fight not for victory. We fight from victory. We fight not to win, but we fight because Christ has already won. Joined to our Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are, present tense, we are more than conquerors. So then the question arises, what's the armor for? And the armor is how believers acquire, how we obtain, how we engage God's power in us. I'd have you look at verses 10 and 11, and I'd have you note the coordination. This is chapter 6, 10 and 11. Note the coordination between that phrase, strength of his might, and the command, put on the armor of God. This is a conjunction, if you will. Standing in the strength of his might and putting on the armor are very closely related. It is the conjunction of the power and the tools that help us make use of it. At your house, you may have 220 volts running up to your panel box, 230 amps. You may have that running up to your house, the three wires coming in and so forth and so on. But you need lamps, you need appliances, you need power tools to make use of it, don't you? Somewhat similarly, the pieces of God's armor unleash God's power in us. They help us to make use of that power to help us to follow Christ and to unfollow Satan. Put it another way, and this is definitely a Wayne County illustration, 
Just like a large caliber gun can be an equalizer for a 125 pound woman who's facing a 325 pound mugger, an equalizer, so God's armor is the Christian's equalizer against Satan. Now mind you, that gun's not gonna do that lady any good unless she uses it or even just to brandish it and as a deterrent. And so it is with the armor of God. We have it. This is the equalizer in Christ. But we have to put it on. We have to make use of it and not neglect it. And to help us take that seriously, I'd have you note, secondly, who is against us. And that's Satan and his very loyal, very experienced, skilled administration. Verse 11, for we do not, or 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I trust that we are all on board with this truth. That what, this, that what the scripture testifies about the devil, that we take it as God's truth. What it says about the demons, the fallen angels, and human pawns, I hope and I trust that we take this as God's truth. And that there is a genuine, intelligent evil in the world and beyond it. Intelligent, evil angels and people in our world that the evil in our world is not something that's random. It doesn't just happen. There are evil beings in the world and their purpose is to dishonor God ultimately. Their purpose is to ruin what God created in order to antagonize him, in order to hurt him, to make him pay for casting Satan and his angels, his fallen angels, out of heaven when they rebelled. There is positive, personal, intelligent evil at work here. Do we recognize too how very strong and wickedly wise and intelligent the devil and his administration are? This, the evil one may very well be creation's most powerful creature. In seemingly a few minutes, he took, in seemingly a few minutes, Excuse me. He took down two perfect humans in a perfect setting, in a perfect society. Adam and Eve could not excuse their fall by blaming poverty, or they couldn't blame their parents, although they tried, or police brutality, or anything else. Satan and his crew are just that strong, took down two perfect humans in seemingly a few minutes. And remember that when we were unbelievers, we followed his lead and we didn't know that he was playing us like a fiddle. And remember that there is still an old nature in us that still wants to play the tune the devil was calling. Paul names the particular danger the devil particular danger the devil poses to Christians here, um, and that is that he's a plotter, that he's a planner, that he is one who is a patient trapper, and he knows his his prey. Paul talks about the tricks, or the wiles, or the schemes of the devil. The evil one has studied humans since God has created us, and since he fell. He and his administration have studied us individual humans. As, and that's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? That this malignant being, he's not God, he's not everywhere at once, but he has an administration of fallen angels. This malignant being and his crew know your pet sins, no, my pet sins, knows our personal weaknesses and failings. They've made a study of us. 
They know how to exploit us. They know how to ambush us. Verse 11, it's the devil's schemes, the devil's trickery for which we need the armor of God to protect us as we hold our spiritual ground. Some years ago, C.S. Lewis, the English author, wrote a book that was, a, it, it's a very helpful book um, that outlines Satan's methods for trying to trip people up. It's called The Screw Tape Letters. I'm sure there's a copy, or quite sure there's a copy in our church library. Excuse me. I'm going to blame this on a tickle and not on the devil, but <laughs> the effect may be the same. The screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis couched it in a story, but that does not take away from the helpfulness of the book because Lewis knew his Bible, and it does bring out how Satan likes to trip people up. There's a Puritan by the name of Thomas Brooks who also collected a helpful series of sermons on Satan's trickery, and it's titled Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. Um, and it does, again, show how the evil one likes to trip people up, the kinds of methods that he uses, and also the ways to fight back against them. Paul reminds us here in this text that the battles that we're fighting, our actual battles are fought in the spiritual realm. Verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our real battle is with forces that our own physical eyes cannot see. But when God's word is taken up and the spirit applies it in us, it is like night vision goggles. God helps us to see in the darkness what the evil one is up to, at least enough so that we can fight back. Have you ever noticed, talking about you know, spiritual activity, have you ever noticed how sinful thoughts just seem to pop into your head? And oftentimes those are sinful thoughts that are very related to your specific weakness. Um, your pet sin, as someone might say, or your darling sin, as the Puritans say. And you say, where in the world did that come from? Well, I'm suggesting where in the world that came from. It came from the place of darkness. The battle is spiritual. Preacher John MacArthur noted that the, the scripture attributes satanic and demonic involvement in this world system of evil and of its rejection of God. He noted, for example, in Ezekiel 28, that the prophet Ezekiel saw behind the physical flesh and blood king of Tyre, he saw Satan at work behind that. Also, Daniel, in chapter 10 of Daniel, talks about demons behind the empire's rulers. You have idolatry, which to us looks very simple and uninformed. You know, okay, so you've got this log here that's all carved up and people fall down before it and present offerings. It all, it's wrong, we think, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong, but we don't think much more of that. You say, oh, I'd never do that. What we don't realize is that the worship of idols involves demon worship. And that's, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's talking about the Corinthians. You, you can't go and be going to and, and, and sacrifice to idols and then come to the Lord's table because what the, they offer to the, these idols is demon. They're sacrificing to demons. And Psalm 106 talks about too, when Israel offered her sacrifices to idols, they were making sacrifice to demons. Again, remember that the, our battle isn't with flesh and blood so much as it is with the spiritual realm behind it. And that people in the world do follow the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's at work in the sons of disobedience. Our battle is spiritual. Now, having said that, I want to give a caution. 
we are not supposed to see demons behind every curtain. Some people get so caught up in studying about the demonic and the work of evil and the work of the devil that they get spiritually paranoid, shall we say. We need to know about these things and that there is evil at work, evil beings at work, but we're not to be preoccupied with it. And the other thing, the other um, extreme that people go to is that they blame their sins on Satan. But the devil can tempt us, but he can't make us sin. That is our choice. And God gives us the power to resist him. What I'm trying to come back around to is this, though, that the spiritual world has more influence on the physical world than we realize. Satan has an administration. Verse 12 talks about these cosmic authorities and so forth. And for us, not knowing the enemy and the power of the enemy, it will cost us dearly in our war um, in, against the evil one and the church's war against the forces of evil. And so the encouragement is that we would know well what God tells us of who is against us and also who is for us. And finally, who wins? And that is that if it is rightly employed, the armor gives us firepower to stand fast in holy obedience to God. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm that you may be able to stand and withstand. We're talking about staying power. We're talking about ability. We're talking about leverage. We're talking about perseverance in obedience to God in time of testing. That's the evil day. Standing is refusing to compromise with evil. It's refusing to give in to it. Winning is maintaining self-control and honoring God's boundaries. Someone reminds us that the ground that Satan disputes and challenges us to abandon, let us remember that that is already God's ground. Sanctity of life is God's ground that we are to hold. Biblical marriage and family is God's ground that we are to hold and not abandon. Marriage vow fidelity is God's ground. Protecting private property and not stealing, not giving in to the push of socialism. This is God's ground. Sexual purity is God's ground. Biblical worship and witness is God's ground. Loving our neighbor and forgiving one another is God's ground. Satan disputes these and more. He threatens, he punishes people who stand on God's ground and refuse to move. And the armor of God persevered, per, continued in, will help us to hold out and to hold on, just like we wish for the Ukrainians. Remember, again, that we don't fight for victory so much as we fight from the victory that Christ has already won for us. And the Lord's Supper is our occasion this morning to eat with the victor who overcame the world. We come to one who loves us, to one who understands us, to one who experienced far and away more than we ever will, the suffering and the struggle against Satan and his administration. We come to one who even in heaven still bears the scars, his battle scars, to remind us that he has gone before us, that he has made our way and that he is our way. He puts these physical, visible tokens of his love, he puts them into our hands and for our understanding 
and for our, I should say, he puts these tokens of his love and understanding of, of his fruitful struggle into our hands. And by partaking of the Lord's Supper, we, we proclaim to others, but we also proclaim to ourselves the Lord's death and his victory until he comes. And by partaking of the Lord's Supper, he reminds us that united to him in faith, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He reminds us that we've won the war in him, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And while it is easy to feel defeated, every one of us may have some time during the week when we just really feel defeated and there are times when we really are down in the dumps. And those are the times that it's so hard to do, but we have to remember who we are and lift up our heads. We are his, and he is ours. And so I encourage, and I'm talking to myself too, that we would act like God's children and not like cowering slaves, because that's not who we are anymore. The Lord can help us to overcome the devil's tricks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this light that pierces the darkness. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us. That he who is in us is more powerful than he who is in the world. We thank you for the way that your spirit works in us and with us, that he, he checks our spirits and works in our conscience. We thank you for guidance and illumination that the spirit gives, helping us to see and understand scripture and to see how it applies. We thank you for all the ways that you are at work in us and through us, ways that we may not understand, but you are there. And we bless you and thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you will bless this word to our hearts, that you will help us to be faithful soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ and to take up the armor of God and that our, we would not let down our guard. Help us, Lord, to hold the ground that you've assigned to us. And we pray that you would bless the celebration of the supper to our hearts. And thank you for this privilege that you give us to eat with the victor even Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'd like to give an invitation to all who are believers in our Lord Jesus Christ that you would partake with us at the Lord's table. It's the Lord's table, not ours. And um, so if you're a believer in the Savior, you're walking with the Lord, uh, please do feel free to partake. The Bible does encourage us to examine our hearts before the Lord and in an examined state where we've given our sins up to the Lord and as much as it lies with us, we're at peace with everyone, um, that in that state we are certainly welcome to join him at the table. But if we're not walking with the Lord or we're not a believer in the Lord, then we need to keep ourselves from the Lord's table until we do come to return to walk with the Lord or until we come to know the Lord and to, uh, to know his salvation. And so with that, um, we want to sing a hymn. And so I'm going to invite you to stand with me and, and our praise band to play, Speak, O Lord.
Amen. Thank you, and we may be seated. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, our Lord took the cup when he had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. I'm going to ask, Father, if you would give thanks for the bread of the Lord. We come before you today with glad hearts at uh, the sacrifice that you willingly gave for us. Your church cries out to you this morning. We are the sinners and the saints, all in one. And we're the saints because of your sacrifice on the cross. There's only one way, Lord, and that's through you. And we believe this, and we cherish it, so our bodies don't have to be broken. Thank you for all you do for us. May we cling to your promises, and may we seek to put on your armor and bear your image in a way to the world that pleases you. Amen. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel, bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children, May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord.
This bread that we break, this is the communion of the body of Christ, the victor. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Amen. I'm going to ask now, please, um, Tom, if you would give thanks for the cup of the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you that we can fight from a winning side. We thank you that you loved us so much and you went to the cross of Calvary and you shed your blood for us. And we thank you for what that means, that it covers our sins forever if we accept you as Savior of our lives. We thank you for your all you've done for us and we thank you for your love for us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep man, man and beast. You save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There they are, the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise.
son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The cup of blessing that we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are seated on the throne of grace and that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we do come boldly before you for mercy, for grace to help in time of need. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who mourn and give grace to them, that you would bring comfort to them through the gospel. For those, Lord, who have passed away, who knew you, thank you for that hope of everlasting life and the great reunion and glory. For those who have lost loved ones and they're not sure about if they knew you or not, we pray for that special comfort that only you can give, Lord. Father, we pray you'll be with those who are battling with cancer, the ones who have been held up before you in previous weeks and for months for some and one who has now been placed in hospice. And just pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would bring a word of grace to her. Give grace, Father, we pray. We pray for those who are battling with the effects of a stroke, and, uh, and one in particular whose finances are so adversely affected by her care after the effects of the stroke. We pray for two very young little children who were ill, and who, at least presently, are not able to keep weight on. We pray for your mercy on those little tykes, Lord, and that you would be with their family as they wait and watch. Father, we pray for those who are persecuted. We pray for the Ukrainians and their people, Lord. uh, And we know that there are many people of faith in that country as well. Father, we pray that you will give what is best. We pray that you would turn away the oppressor. Lord, thank you that you know what to do and how to do it. And Lord, again, we ask, please give what is best. Father, we pray for the, our, our missionaries, Dave and Kim, in their ministry at the Eth- Ethnos Bible Institute. We pray your grace upon them as they labor there as uh, Dave is an instructor and Kim has so many hats that she wears there. We pray you'll be with them and the students there, especially in this coming uh, season as they're seeking to discern your call upon their lives, whether you're calling them to a, a mission field. Father, we pray for wisdom and discernment in our pastor search process, Lord. And we pray that you will be with our rulers those who bear the authority over us, whether at the local level in our town board, our supervisor and town councilors, Lord, and justices, up to the federal level, Lord, those who bear the authority over us. You are the great king. Give grace, give wisdom, give strength. Turn us back to you, please. Turn us back that you may be honored aright and feared aright. Lord, we pray you'll grant reviving graces and that it would begin with Christians, Lord, in the churches and spread beyond. 
Father, there are so many things to ask, so many needs. We thank you that you are able to handle all of them and that you hear the prayers of your children, even the ones that are only spoken in tears, but you hear. You are great and greatly to be praised. And we ask all this now in the name of Jesus, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we have our closing song and it talks about the armor of God. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Shall we stand up as we sing it? Hope you can stand a story before the benediction. Yesterday, one of our neighbor kids came to our house selling candy bars so he could go to Christian camp. And he has all kinds of tassel hats and caps, but he couldn't find them. So he has on a Burger King golden cardboard hat. The reason I say that is what is it going to be when we get up there and there are crowns on all your heads? Jesus is the great victor, and he brings his people along. Receive his parting blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you forever. Amen.